Fala pessoal, tudo bem? Olha só que ano, né? Que ano que tem sido esse ano de 2020, não é verdade? E ao longo desses vários meses, com tudo que aconteceu em vários lugares do mundo, se tratando de, de lockdown, de quarentena, do vírus em si, nós aprendemos muito do que já aconteceu. Tem muitos ganhadores de prêmio Nobel, epidemiologistas, médicos, etc, cientistas falando e publicando muita coisa bacana sobre tudo isso. Nós já temos uma boa base de dados, estatística que a gente pode avaliar para ter uma melhor noção de como agir a essa altura. O problema é, eu acho que ah, nós não estamos tendo acesso tão claro ou essa informação não está tendo tanta atenção quanto merecido, na minha opinião, e é por isso que eu trago nesse vídeo aqui para tentar esclarecer algumas coisas, mostrar para vocês os fatos, estatísticas e tudo mais, para que todo mundo possa tomar a decisão de ficar amedrontado ou não, enfim, eu acho que ter direito às informações básicas, né, aos fatos, e dados é um direito de fato de cada um de nós. E para conversar comigo, para mostrar para vocês também é, mais sobre esse assunto, eu trouxe aqui um irlandês, que é um bioquímico, é, o Ivor Cummings, é uma pessoa que eu conheço e confio bastante desde o tempo quando ele falava mais sobre nutrição, sobre colesterol bastante, sobre é, colesterol baseado em evidência, etc. Ele fez um trabalho muito bom nisso e desde o começo do ano ele tem dedicado seus dias aí a procurar esses estudos, encontrar os fatos e também mostrar, tentar ilustrar se dá, analisar, interpretar os dados e fatos sobre essa coisa maluca que está acontecendo esse ano aqui. Então, eu achei que é uma pessoa extremamente capacitada para trazer os dados para a gente. Então, por isso eu convido aqui, é uma honra receber ele aqui, o Ivor Cummins, direto lá de Dublin, na Irlanda. Então, para a gente começar essa discussão nossa aqui, o vídeo está inteiramente legendado, então não tem problema, você pode acompanhar tranquilamente. Eu vou pedir para você deixar um like para mim, para me motivar a continuar fazendo esse tipo de, de esse vídeo, compartilhando esse tipo de informação. Eu rodo a vinheta e a gente já começa a entrevista, então. Um lembrete antes de começar aqui, corre um risco aí deste vídeo aqui, por qualquer motivo que seja, ser censurado, né? Porque parece que tem uma resistência muito grande aí hoje em dia à ciência, a fatos, estatísticas, etc. Então, caso isso acontecer, paciência, mas por isso que eu deixo na descrição aqui, tá? Eu deixo um link para você baixar este vídeo completinho e você tem minha permissão explícita aqui para você fazer, subir esse arquivo, subir isso aqui para o teu canal se você quiser publicar onde você quiser, ok? Para certificar que essa informação não saia do ar. So, hi, Ivor. Thank you very much for your time today. How are you doing back in, up in Ireland? Oh, great. No problems, Rodrigo. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Ivor, I just want to congratulate you for all the work you've been doing uh, for the past months. I know you since uh, about for a few years. When you used to uh, talk more about nutrition and stuff, I understand this is a complete priority that we need to bring science back to the world. And uh, I like something you said, is that we live in like the post-science era. It's kind of scary, I think. But uh, in, uh, with this conversation, I hope we can bring back some data, some facts, uh, so people can decide by themselves whether they want to be scared or not. I think the facts need to be out there. And by now, I think, Uh, we have been collecting a lot of data. There's a lot of uh, facts and, and data and studies published about this, this very subject. And I don't think they're getting the, the attention they deserve. So that's basically our goal today, just to share with people what we know by now about the virus, about the numbers, about the testing. So they know more information. They can make, they can make their own minds, right, based on the proper data. And I think you're very, one of the, the best ones out there, in my opinion. And when it comes to this, you're compiling the information in a very easy way, a very uh, comprehensive way, always with references and stuff. So you're a data guy and, uh, and an engineer by background. I also have like a science uh, degree. So it's very easy, I think, second nature for us to have this logic inside our minds, like working. So it's very easy to notice when things are not like they should be, or there's like some, uh, you know, uh, irration irrationalities here and there. So if we have a conversation based on data and facts here, I think it should help everyone. What do you think about that? Yeah, it sounds great. And most of it's in my head, but I can share a few slides if it, it helps later on. That's perfect. I know your head's probably an encyclopedia right now. All right. So I think the first thing we can uh, cover here is basically the threat itself. So the virus itself, we know SARS-CoV-2, we know it's a coronavirus. But what else we know more now that we didn't necessarily know back in, in February or January? For example, 
would be nice if you could share uh, the seasonality of the virus. Is there a seasonality of the, for this virus? What about how it spreads? Because people go crazy. Oh my God, it stays on glass surfaces for two weeks. It stays on, on the floor for like five days, whatever. And uh, so is it spread only by droplets or aerosols or and what's the seasonality of it? What, what, what we know about the threat itself, the virus itself by now? Right. Well, SARS-CoV-2, the name of the virus, yeah. and in unfortunate people, it causes COVID-19, which is the disease state. Uh, and it's a, there's a lot of coronaviruses studied over the last 30, 40 years. So it's part of a family of the common cold viruses. This one is particularly hard hitting to the elderly. Although coronaviruses, cold viruses in the past have caused major hits in care homes. Um, just people don't realize that, uh, you know, mortality too. But this one's particularly virulent and it is very hard. So it hits anyone who's got immunocompromise. They have any immune system problems. And there you'll also get people with diabetes and other things. Well, their immune systems won't work as well. So they're getting much higher risk ratios of being affected. Um, but primarily the aged, uh, because the aged become more diabetic their immune systems fade as they become very old. So that's why we're seeing in many countries, 60% of the mortality is in care homes. Right. So it's a flu-like illness though, and it's sharply seasonal. So we've seen now with Corona, uh, myself and others predicted in March this year that it would be powerfully seasonal. And that's exactly what happened. So we've seen in Northern Europe, which is the Northern temperate zone, uh, or Northeast America, we see the March-April triggering of the virus, mm -hmm. and it caused all the impacts then. And we see in Southern America, Mexico, Brazil, Peru, that are more like Southern um, tropical type regions, they're getting hit from April, May, June, July in a longer, slower rise. Mm -hmm. So very, very powerfully seasonal. And even in Australia, which is... Uh, southern temperate, we see that very little happened them in March and April. They were lucky to get the virus during their summer or end of summer. But mm -hmm. then, of course, they had problems more recently during their winter. So, yeah, yeah seasonal. Yeah, it's usually seasonal. And another interesting fact is about the curve, right? In the northern hemisphere, we see more of a sharp curve. Um, and whereas the southern hemisphere, we see more like a slow, like smooth slope. And I, I, I think you mentioned like a, a book that was written quite a while ago, right, about influenza. And, and you can basically um, overlap what's going on now and pretty much matches all the, those studies. Can you mention that book? What's the name? Yeah, that book is from Hope Simpson. So he's a doctor in England who set up the first influenza uh, transmission laboratory in 1933 in England. And he studied transmission of influenza-like diseases for, would you believe, over 50 years. Wow. And he actually, you know, recorded all of the dormancy, the transmission, uh, the seasonality. And he went through all aspects of influenza transmission. I think he understood it more than anyone in the world. Uh, and I featured mm -hmm. slides uh, from Hope Simpson's book actually in my presentations. And I might actually just share now because that's a good segue. Oh, yeah. So here we see the coronavirus in Northern Europe is very similar to influenza. It's sharply seasonal. It's little later usually. So this one hit in February, March. Um, because they come a little later than the influenzas generally. Mm -hmm. And then if we just show here Italy, you oh, can yeah. see the Gompertz curve you described. And that's the same all across Europe. And whether you lock down or not, doesn't really make much difference. Mm -hmm. And here we can see Brazil and Peru, uh, dramatically different. Uh, Brazil, I know they had some local lockdowns, yeah. but famously the president said no lockdown. Peru had military-grade lockdown and masks, yeah. I believe, back in March or April. It doesn't make much difference to the mortality because, as yeah. Hope Simpson knew, the transmission is so subtle, the particles are so tiny, airborne. There's even papers published on SARS-CoV-2 also having come to Europe from China on the trade winds. 
up, I think, oh, wow. in the troposphere. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. it gets everywhere. I mean, you know, we, there's an enclosed order of nuns in Italy that they don't talk to people. They're enclosed their whole life. You know, the super religious special yeah. order. Uh, yeah. And they, a load of those guys got it. And no one was yeah. near. So, I mean, it, it's very hard for humans to, to deal with an influenza uh, nanovirus or a coronavirus. We can deal with bacteria or we can control rats like that brought the Black Plague through fleas and malaria through mosquitoes. There's not a whole lot you can do with, with a, a flu-like virus. It's yeah. just sadly the way. And the way you, uh, you mentioned about uh, transmission, and, and that's a hot topic because th throughout the, the pandemic, they have been telling us that it's, it's only droplets, right? So if you have droplets, so wear your mask so you don't spread the droplets, don't touch surfaces because of droplets. But we kind of know, not only I think COVID for COVID-19, for this coronavirus, but the influenza virus, all respiratory viruses, exactly what you said, that they can be transmissible via aerosols, right? Which is like nanoparticles, tiny, they go even through the pores of the mask, like typical masks and stuff. So um, is it true that the CDC and also the WHO finally are admitting that and saying that, yeah, it's spread through the air, so we kind of need to learn how to live with it. It's kind of naive to try to block all of this. And uh, we have plenty of evidence, like, like you just mentioned, where um, people are very in close environment, they still get the virus. So it seems like it does spread through the air, right? Yeah, that, that, that always would have been the assumption, but you're right. They seem to want to focus on surfaces for a long time, but then they brought in masks mandatory in Europe when the epidemic was long over in the middle of the summer. So yeah. to be honest, I can't keep track of the WHO and, and the other authorities. Yeah. They just seem to be, as we say in Ireland, all over the place. So I've been watching in horror uh, over the months as the story has changed back and forward, whereas the story when myself and my professors and experts all over the world always stayed consistent. And I'll give you an example. So we saw the seasonality, and from Hope Simpson, we knew it was going to be the case, but we verified it clearly by around April coming into May with the rise that we predicted in the southern tropical. And it came bang on time in, in mm -hmm. Brazil and, and Peru elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and then when that began to get talked about, seasonality, which made this virus look more like a bad flu, more normal, suddenly the WHO came out with announcements that this virus is not seasonal. So it was almost like, and there's several more examples, when the reality began to emerge and became popular and was being discussed, the WHO seemed to come out and deny it. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's the really unusual stuff going on and dynamics in this that have nothing to do with science. Very unusual. Yeah. But seasonality yeah. is clear. And, um, you know, we can see here Italy and, and we'll see more graphs as well. Yeah. Uh, the Brazil no lockdown, the lockdown in Peru makes no difference. The virus triggers with seasonal factors. Now, ultraviolet light flux, human immunity shifts, humidity. There's many factors, but the reality is, the key thing is, it's seasonal and it follows the patterns. Uh, yeah. So I'll just put one important thing to note is, and this is crucial, in Brazil, SARS-CoV-2 was identified in November 2019 samples mm -hmm. in the human sewage. So SARS-CoV-2 came into Brazil and started going through the whole population, same time as it did in Europe. But then the virus triggered in Europe here, according to the rules of the virome, and triggered in Brazil way out here. So there's a dormancy effect as well that Hope Simpson spoke of that the virus can come in and spread and lie dormant and then right. trigger at a certain point. Now, I don't talk too much about that because you'll be accused of not having proof. But the reality yeah. is, you know, we know the virus is here. Yeah, I have been studies on that for a long time. Uh, yeah, in Brazil, we had some lockdowns here and there, for sure. Uh, yeah, there's locking down businesses and definitely mandating masks everywhere. So it's still kind of not normal for sure. But uh, one thing I think we should touch on is the 
Because at the beginning, they talked about, oh, it's a very deadly virus and stuff, and it kills people, of course, sadly, right? It, the susceptible, uh, unfortunately, will um, suffer. Uh, but, but one thing is like knowing more about how, um, how dangerous the virus actually is when it comes to like infection fatality rate, for example, right? I think that's a, a big number. Since the beginning, it was all the way up, and now we know a lot about it because it went through the whole world, pretty much. So we kind of know more about that. And uh, yeah, so I, I saw some numbers like um, in India, for example, the infection fatality rate, uh, they say it's a bit less than 0.1%. In Iceland, Austria, Kenya, Colorado, LA, Argentina, between 0.1 to 0.3%. And the WHO just said that probably 10% of the world's population is probably infected. But that gives us an... Um, IFR of 0.13% roughly. And I just want to bring back that the flu, the IFR for the flu, I think is estimated 0.1% too, right? So what do we know about that? Do we agree with that based on the data you've been seeing lately? Yeah, so I'd say 0.1 or 0.15 is fair. And um, Professor Ionidas, who has uh, kind of one of the top epidemiologists in the Stanford, world and evidence-based medicine professors, he's settling down around 0.15 now as well. He started off at 0.25. So around 0.15 is fair. But I would say on average in a country where the virus has passed through the population with no lockdown like Sweden and has gone through its curve, the ultimate reality is 0.05% mortality is what you can expect on average, you know, yeah. because not everyone gets infected, even though the virus has gone through the whole population. But 0 0.1, 0 0.15, I think is fair. And it's going to be very different. Like in Japan, it might be point, you know, zero, zero something because their aged people are so healthy. So they're going to have yeah. a very low uh, fatality rate. And then in countries like America, sadly, you know, with very poor metabolic health, uh, you're going to get relatively higher. So the big factor is the metabolic health of your population, particularly the metabolic health of your aged. Right. That's, that's the big factor. Like Vietnam is a tiny rate right. as well. Um, and the other big factor is how soft or hard your prior year's mortality was, especially Good in point. the aged. Mm. So Sweden had 2019 and early 2020 had a remarkably low uh, mortality rate in the aged and in general. And yeah. that's why Sweden got hit pretty hard. They caught up with a yeah. lot of people who'd built up who were very susceptible. So that's going to massively change, you know, your mortality rates as well. The only thing that doesn't really change the rates much is lockdowns and things. They don't right. really affect things yeah we're definitely going to get to that can you just quickly explain to people that are not uh, acquainted with the idea of um, the infection fatality rate what it means basically yeah so the case fatality rate cfr is when you have actual cases in the hospital and you find out what percentage of them pass away or that they die and that's the case fatality rate but that's way wrong because that's only the guys you're looking at in your hospital you're yeah. missing all the millions of people who never got near the hospital. Right. And then the infection fatality rate is when you attempt to uh, look at all the people who got infected. Mm -hmm. But the problem there is you're also missing vast amounts of people who got infected but had no symptoms and you never right. got to test them. So you're right. missing the denominator in the equation. Yeah. yeah. So the best measure is the population fatality rate, the PFR. And right. that's basically what I mentioned, the 0.05%. When it's gone through your population and the season has passed, what fatality rate did you end up with? And right. um, that one is, is the hardest measure. Uh, and Sweden was 0 0.058, UK was 0 0.063, you know, Japan is 0 0.00 two or something because they're so healthy, uh, et cetera. Yeah. 
Yeah, good, good, good point. And when it comes to, to deaths, because like we said, many people unfortunately uh, die because of this disease, or they die because of other diseases. But when it comes to this disease, what's more or less a distribution of death that we see when it comes to age? Like you mentioned, we mentioned elderly homes, comorbidities. So, so people understand, I mean, yeah, there are a lot of people that unfortunately are passing because of this virus. But what's the main, like, the characteristics of this population? Should we all be as scared as everyone else or some, yeah, what's the distribution of, of that? I'd say if you're under 60 and you haven't got a specific, uh, like, stage four cancer or immunocompromised problem and you're under 60, you can just forget about it, pretty much. It's not really any different than a, a bad flu. There's no point thinking about it. And they made the point in the UK and elsewhere that people in their 70s and older are around a thousand times more at risk than mm -hmm. young people in their 20s, 30s or younger. So you're right. talking about that enormous difference. I said at the start of this back in March, we should be protecting the people who are over 60 with significant disease or over 70 in general. And that's what Sweden did. Uh, that's yeah. what they attempted to do, because that's where the risk is. Now, the latest figures from the CDC, which, by the way, this is from the CDC in America, but Facebook fact checker took it down and banned it, <laughs> even though it's straight from CDC, because they yeah. didn't like it for some reason. So not to 19 years old, 99.997% survival. And it's probably higher. These are conservative figures. 20 to 49 years old, 99.98% survival. And again, that's conservative. Uh, 50 to 69 years, 99.5% survival. And then 70 plus years, 946 So that's where the wow. big change is. And I have loads of graphs on this. It's really in your 70s and beyond where it, it becomes a very significant thing to be concerned about. But right. when you go down the age ranges and people who are reasonably healthy, it, it just the risk disappears. And I yeah. give a good example, Rodrigo. In Ireland, in our epidemic, we had 1,600 people uh, who were marked as died from COVID, but it was really with. The figures later look right. more like 800. But, but in Ireland, with four and a half million people, with 1,600. So let's say that's true. 95% of those people who died in Ireland were so aged or near death that they were never given an intensive care unit. Wow, 95%. Ethically, the doctors made the decision that independent of COVID, it wasn't reasonable to try and save them because they were so aged or so moribund. So that'll mm. give people an idea. 19 out of 20, it's not even appropriate to try and save them. Right. Yeah. Oh my God. No one you said 95%. 95%. So when we keep that in mind, so the, the actual risk for the free living people, because we're all being kind of destroyed or locked down or... I mean, other measures uh, to kind of protect uh, this small minority, let's put it this way. But the actual risk for, like you said, for free living people, healthy people from like a childhood up to 70 and beyond, if you're, if you're healthy, is way less than what we believe it is, I guess, and based on this information. Yeah, and Professor Yonidas made it very clear if you're in your 40s or below, there's a lower risk than the bad flu. And if you're 70s and above, there's a higher risk, much higher than your average bad flu. So that's kind of the breakdown. It's an older person's risk. And that's right. why we should have protected the older people. And I'm still sharing, actually. So if you look at the screen, to give a compare, in 2018, yeah. in 360 million people of Europe, the death is tracked the excess mortality in the winter season was 140,000 excess. And you can see the hump there. Yeah. And this year, there's around 180,000. 
but it was all focused in a short time period because you notice 2019 and 20, mm -hmm. there was a remarkable lack of excess mortality in the winters. So yeah. there were a lot of people sadly built up. So Corona just took them out really quickly. But 108 is 30 percent higher than 2018. And no one did anything in 2018. Masks, right? No one even knew. And yeah. 2000 was worth year 2000. So we see this again and again and again. And Sweden, in Ireland, Ireland for the first six months of the year had what was seen as a big epidemic, lots of mortality. But the first six months of the year average mortality is around the same as the previous five years, slightly wow. lower than three of them in the first six months when we had our epidemic. So yeah. the actual impact is not much different than your average risk of mortality. It's just it occurs in a short, sharp shock or a couple yeah. of months period. Mm. But yet we're taking yeah, extraordinary measures, um, right? For something that doesn't seem to be that extraordinary. And one point I'd like to, to bring here is um, the, the whole thing about cases, right? Because that's, that's where the conversation seem, seems to be, like when it comes to the media and the message uh, being put uh, to the population. When it, uh, take cases, right? And now, in many countries of the world, we're seeing more cases than we, we, we've seen in the, at the beginning of the year, right? Because they're testing, they're ramping, rep, ramping up the tests way, way more. So I like the, the, the term you have been using. You have been using the term uh, case damage. It's a, a pandemic of cases, not actual, uh, not actual deaths or hospitalizations or ICU usage. So when it comes to a case, right? What, what, what does it mean if you say, oh, someone tested positive for this PCR test, right? Someone tested positive. What people believe that means is that person is infected, probably symptomatic, and is a vehicle of transmission of the disease, right? That's what people think when they hear a case, so a positive test. So can you please enlighten us a little bit about more uh, the, the nuances when it comes to the PCR test, what case actually means, or yeah, if you can break down that a little bit, I think it would be useful. Yeah, no problem, Rodrigo. So basically a case traditionally always meant a hospitalized or significantly sick person who carried a certain virus. That's a case of that virus. Yeah. We're calling PCR test positives now cases, but that's misleading. And many media are calling them COVID-19, which is the severe disease, which is doubly misleading. Right. So the cases you hear about are positive PCR tests. And the PCR test simply finds a tiny fragment of the virus, tiny right. protein, maybe one, maybe two fragments. So when you get PCR positives, if you test 10,000 people and you get 100 cases, well, that's 100 PCR test positives. In there, 50 to 90 of them will be false positives because mm -hmm. the test is limited. Another bunch of them will be dead virus fragments because they had the infection maybe four weeks ago and now they're fine, but there's still fragments left. They last for months. So that's meaningless too. And then another bunch of them will have the infection, but it's at so low a level that they can't transmit and it makes no difference. And those people are in the numbers too. So finally, you're left with a small number of the cases are actually symptomatic, transmissible, or affected by the disease. And that's the number we should be thinking about. But that's a small fraction of the PCR positives that they're calling cases. So, right. I mean, I showed it here, uh, and again, it's on the screen now. We had an epidemic, and I know this is Europe as an example, or Northeast America is the same. We had an epidemic where we had lots of cases, PCR positives, and we had mortality. That's what makes it an epidemic when you've got a big impact. Around May, uh, the epidemic was essentially over, or May into June. Mm -hmm. But if you keep testing and testing like they were doing, in fact, they went up a factor of five, the amount of testing they were doing. So they're going to find the virus fragments. Right. Then you get a case-demic. And that's the problem. 
your mortality is gone, your impacts are gone. So in the UK and Ireland and all across Europe, we had four months of a case demic where they kept talking about cases, yeah. but there was nothing happening in the ICUs or mortality. So it's kind of crazy. And um, I'll just see, can I find the graph here? Oh, there's the graph, yeah. This is uh, one, one of the case demic graphs. This one, I think, is Spain. So you see the cases during the epidemic go through the roof yeah. and come back down again. The mortality is shown here, you get impacts. But then we started a case demic during the summer in Europe. And the testing here actually is at such a higher rate than it was back here, that in a sense, this graph is really up off the screen compared to back there. Um, but, you know, there's no mortality really. One, one person per million per day with the virus. So the epidemic's over, but you've got cases and they're all locking down societies, shutting down businesses and absolutely going crazy based on no epidemic, no real mortality. Yeah, in this I've watched graph, that for yeah, no, I agree. And here in Canada, we were just talking before I started the recording, it's the same thing. We have more cases now than we had before because we're testing way more, right? You can test yourself everywhere pretty much and you're incentivized to be tested too. So you have a lot of tests, way more tests than before. And yeah, no wonder you find a lot of virus fragments. And as you mentioned, F, uh, out of like 100 PCR positive tests, what would you say is the amount of positive tests that actually can be concerned, uh, concerning out of 100? What do you think, like 10%? Well, yeah, maybe maybe ten percent of the hundred, maybe maybe less, depending. For a couple of months there in Europe, uh, they were around one percent or two percent of the tests were positive, but the test itself is right. only ninety nine point five percent accurate, and that's right. on a good day in laboratory conditions. So let's say it's ninety nine percent accurate, and one percent of the positives are false. Well, you're only getting say two percent positives. So a half of them can be false. If you're only getting 1% positives from your tests, nearly all of them could be false. So I'd say if you also cut out the false positives, the dead viral fragments from people who exactly. had it before, and you also cut out the people who have such a low level of active infection that they don't matter, they don't transmit, and they're, they're asymptomatic, you're left really with just a small proportion of symptomatic people that you should be concerned about. And it's that little figure they should be using, but they're using the right. huge figure of all the positives. Yeah, yeah, at the beginning, right? At the beginning of the pandemic, all the conversation was around hospitals, like protecting the hospitals and flattening the curve, right? That's all we heard about. And then for some reason, we stopped with that conversation and it became all about cases. So we have one more case, two more cases, whole shopping malls closing down because of one PCR positive. And we just seen that one PCR positive can mean many things, right? It doesn't really necessarily mean it's like infectious person. And people, please bear in mind what we talked at the beginning, right? Which is the virus, what we know about the virus, seasonality, the actual infection and fatality rate. So that's the threat. I think we need to keep that in mind throughout the conversation. But we talk about this virus that we know more about it right now. So people can decide to be scared or not. And uh, when it comes to the, sorry, uh, when it comes to the, the case damage, would you have some more uh, examples of those graphs uh, for other countries? So we don't think that, oh, it's only in Spain that we have more cases than deaths right now. Oh, yeah. I, I do think indeed. Nice. I'll share again. Oh, but I just one thing occurred to me too, just one quick yeah. point. The other sure. thing is dormancy that no one's acknowledging. So a lot of the people that you get positive now, there may most of them may not even be transmitting. So they say, oh, 30% were transmitted in the home. But Hope right. Simpson pointed this out. It's not that simple because dormancy means that you may just find the seasons change and the virus rises in certain people. And it wasn't really that they caught it last week at all. It just rose and mm. enough of it came out to, to show up in the PCR test. So that's just the other thing. 
But this That's is far thing. more complex than they're pretending it's just like handed from person to person. But I'm going to share and um, let me see. I've got lots of these graphs. So can you see those? Yeah. 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 So here's Ireland. They're not up to date fully, but they're good enough. Uh, Ireland case demic, massive cases during the epidemic, and we got the deaths. Epidemic over in May 2020. And we've got the cases through the roof. Well, very big. Uh, huge hysteria, shutting down counties, all that crazy stuff. But as we said, PCR false positive, massive increase in testing, historical infections, and some true positives are in there. But the impacts didn't rise. So you can see there's no, there's no deaths at all. We had five deaths mm -hmm. in the whole month of August out of four and a half million wow. people. Mm -hmm. And they put mandatory masks on us in the middle of that. You know, yeah. crazy. Uh, here's UK, same thing pretty much. You can see on the graph. Um, here's Germany, same thing. Here's uh, Switzerland, big fuss in Switzerland, brought in masks here, mandatory, huh? But mm -hmm. there's nothing going on. Yeah, but we got cases. Yeah, but we know that cases are followed by two weeks by death. Two weeks on this graph is a tiny piece. Yeah. This is 12 yeah. weeks. <laughs> right. Nothing happened, guys. You know, and uh, Spain there, Spain had a little more action because coming September, they had pockets of actual impact in Spain, but it's still like one or one and a half people per million per day with a positive mm -hmm. test passed. And they were nearly all very aged. So it's, it's still, you know, Netherlands is the same. Look at the size of that for all the cases. Yeah. Uh, what else do we have? Oh, look at the France. Big case yeah, demic, no deaths. Uh, now, USA is worth mentioning is different. Right. USA is two regions in one. Right. So they had their Northeast, but then the reason USA is spreading out and still has impacts is it's behaving like Brazil, Peru, Mexico. Right. So they're like two continents in one because of their regional you know, right. environmental differences. It's such a vast right. uh, area. So basically, US, but even US now has come down to an average of around one and a half uh, people passing per million people per day. So it's at tiny levels, but it's not dropping any further. And I think what's happening is it's baselining in the US. So basically what's happening is because anyone with the virus who actually dies within a month gets called a COVID death, they're never going to end because mm -hmm. the virus is endemic. People will always be dying who happen to carry it. So you'll always have COVID deaths forever. I think yeah. that's where USA is now. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense for sure. And uh, yeah, another thing to keep in mind, yeah, we have these deaths and some people, like we said, they pass and that's very sad. But what we need to keep in mind is what's going on with the rest of the population. Oh, um, that must bring is back a disaster. Screen. Yeah, so or the, the lockdowns, I think we can bring the conversation to that because we did like a huge experiment throughout the globe, right? So since the beginning of the year, many countries, many countries locked down completely. Some countries are locking down again now. And I believe that throughout, I mean, the year, we have been collecting data, actually, like facts, right? What happened when you locked down in this country, in that country? So many countries did it. So what kind of information, what kind of facts or uh, published studies we have on lockdowns or how effective they are or how not effective they are when controlling the spread of a respiratory a viral disease like COVID-19, for example? Have we learned with this information or have we not? Yeah, it's the strangest thing I've seen in my life, but it fits in with that nothing makes sense. So basically, we copied the lockdowns from China. So it mm -hmm. looks like in March this year in Europe and then in America, we threw out the rule book and the WHO guidelines on pandemic management. We threw the whole lot on the fire and we took China as a model. That's what happened. I mean, people mm -hmm. can claim some, that's what happened. So all of the science of the past and all the publications 
always said you don't lock down in a pandemic, an influenza-like pandemic. Just don't do it. Um, and that's WHO November 2019. No quarantines, none of that stuff. It's all written. But China locked down, and then suddenly we started locking down. And it made no sense to me. But we did it. Afterwards, no one ever went back to find out or do any science on whether or not the lockdowns change the mortality outcomes. Mm -hmm. Except for people who did the analysis and published and said the answer is lockdowns don't really help at all. So from yeah. the data, we had University of uh, Oxford, Center of Evidence-Based Medicine there, did an analysis and said the lockdown in the UK came after the curve had turned. It didn't change the shape of the curve. We have German university mathematics professors published, uh, same thing. We've got the Woods Hole Institute in the USA in late April published an analysis of Europe, same thing. So there's five or six published analyses, papers, and a whole bunch of uh, published that all say the same thing. Lockdown did not impact the curve worth a damn. There's only one publication I know of that claims lockdown helped, and that was from the guys who did the original crazy projections, Imperial College. Oh, Those yeah. guys went back and found that the lockdown saved lives, but it was based on their original modeling of what would have happened and that was all wrong. So it was a complete yeah. piece of junk paper by the guys who'd been out by a factor of 12 in yeah. their predictions. So I can't describe enough how insane this is. No one wants to go back and look. And all the teams who did look said the lockdown had no real benefit. So yeah. we had all cost suicides, depression, destruction of economy, cancer diagnoses missed. Another study said 200,000 deaths in the next year or two can be expected in England from lockdown, and they didn't save any lives. It's the most outrageous thing in the universe, but no one wants to talk about it. Yeah, it's the first, um, um, what do you say, all doctors, right, they say, okay, first, do no harm, right? The, that's kind of the philosophy behind everything. So we we causing major major damage to the whole population. I don't I don't think anyone doubts that that everyone suffers when you lock down, we destroy businesses, destroy families, destroy relationships, and actually even prevent people from getting treatment. Some people are scared to go to the hospital for cancer surgery because they're afraid of COVID. Right? They lost completely the perspective of risk and everything. But just two days ago, I think, two days ago, I think uh, Dr. David Navarro from the WHO said on camera, like, we from the WHO do not advocate lockdowns for this. Lockdowns, what, what, what was it? Lockdown make poor people awful poor or something like that. They destroy business, destroy lives. Uh, we in the World Health Organization do not advocate lockdowns as a primary means of control of this virus. The only time we believe a lockdown is justified is to buy you time to reorganize, regroup, rebalance your resources, protect your health workers who are exhausted. But by and large, we'd rather not do it. Just look at what's happened to the tourism industry, for example, in the Caribbean or in the Pacific, because people aren't taking their holidays. Looks what's happened to smallholder farmers all over the world because their markets have got dented. Look what's happening to poverty levels. It seems that we may well have a doubling of world poverty by next year. We may well have at least a doubling of child malnutrition because children are not getting meals at school and their parents in poor families are not able to afford it. This is a terrible, ghastly global uh, catastrophe actually. And so we really do appeal to all world leaders Stop using lockdown as your primary control method. Develop better systems for doing it. Work together and learn from each other. Mm. But remember, lockdowns just have one consequence that you must never, ever uh, belittle, and that is making poor people an awful lot poorer. And so the WHO stance right now about lockdowns is very, very, very clear, right? They are calling out government to stop with this madness, yet 
we have lock, uh, lockdowns starting to creep, in, uh, creep up again, uh, like I said, in, in Canada, in Ireland, in Australia, which is one of the saddest things I've ever seen, what they're doing there in Victoria. I can't understand that. I don't know how that is possible. But yeah, what do you have to say about that? Like the WHO saying something one side, governments repeating the same mistake, and the evidence says the opposite. What's going on? Yeah, well, again, it makes no sense. The WHO at the start of the year and their November 19 guidelines was no lockdowns. They were saying around June or July, suddenly that we would need lockdowns to control things. And then there was mandatory masks. And now, like you say, Navarro is saying no lockdowns, guys, unless you are overwhelmed. And I guess you can always say you can try a lockdown if you're completely overwhelmed. Like, like originally, that's why it went in. But th nothing like that is happening. So the WHO are going back and forward. Their chief yeah. technical advisor went on the uh, television two months ago and said asymptomatic people. There's no real evidence of them spreading. Then there was a panic and the next day yeah. they retracted her statement. Yeah. The WHO are all over the map. Yeah. And now they're saying no lockdowns because I think now they realize they are going to be accused of having blood on their hands for the hundreds of maybe a hundred million people who are going to be starving due to this because all the cancer uh, mm. problems, like an oncologist I know told me he's now seeing in Ireland secondary cancers from melanoma that he's never seen in his career. Because the people spent months, like you say, couldn't get in and couldn't go into the hospital. They're coming up with these weird secondary cancers that they're not used to seeing. So I think WHO is now realizing with the Great Barrington Declaration, declaration right. the Oxford professors and, um, Stanford and Harvard. Harvard and Stanford have come out and said, we need to stop lockdowns. The cost benefit is horrific. People are going to starve. They're starving. And I think the WHO got a scare. So Nabarro was rolled out to say, oh, you don't need to lock down unless you're completely overwhelmed. But Nabarro, two days later in Ireland on the radio, was sitting on the fence and kind of half encouraging Irish lockdowns coming into the winter. So like... I, they are just saying, it seems to be completely political to me. Everything. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I, don't, yeah, I think people are seeing that more and more. And when it comes to yeah, speaking up about this subject, everything, like you mentioned, Prof, Professor Ioannidis from Stanford, very, very respected person. A lot of very high caliber people tried to speak up during the, this pandemic and still are. And a lot of them were kind of, you know, made a, a mock out of or just censor a little bit. So, but by now, like the, the Great Barrington um, Declaration, we have epidemiologists from three of the major universities uh, writing this declaration and uh, thousands of more people sign the declaration. So a lot of high profile scientists, Nobel laureates, uh, laure uh, award winners, uh, doctors, experts, epidemiologists, they have been speaking up, right? It's not only like this uh, conspiracy groups and stuff, like in real professionals with real solid reputation. Why, why don't we hear more about this side of the conversation, you think? Yeah, I think the governments decided back in March that censoring was the way to go. And YouTube CEO came out and said, anything that is said that goes against the WHO, we will take it off YouTube. Um, anything that would go against World Health Organization recommendations would be a violation of our policy. And so remove is another really important part of our policy. So you're not just putting the truth next to the lie. You're taking the lie down. That's a pretty aggressive approach. She said that, not me. And that's yeah. what they did. So epidemiologists with enormous experience, like Knut Witkowski, yeah. uh, and there were others as well, like Wolfgang Woderg in Germany. These guys were experienced in swine flu and everything, and, and uh, Ebola. They all came out and began to tell the truth in March. And what they said back then came true perfectly. They were correct, but they were taken off YouTube. And it was made very clear over the months that anyone who spoke up to say this was like a bad flu, that this was seasonal, that lockdowns are causing damage, they might not be giving much benefit. 
they all got censored or their jobs were put at risk and they were made fools of in the media. So the governments and the authorities and the WHO and whoever you want to put up there, they all decided there would be no dissent on this one. And if you think about it, Rodrigo, I knew something was really wrong even back in March. When I first began to study this, because I could see things were going weird in Europe and America, I noticed that a lot of people were saying on the media, we'll never go back to the old normal. There'll be a new normal. Very and I thought, but we haven't even gone through our epidemic curve yet. How can you possibly say that? Mm -hmm. But they did. So it's almost like there were a lot of organizations in the world that when this hit, they saw an opportunity, mm -hmm. an opportunity to take advantage of it. And I think that's what we've seen ever since, whether it's the World Economic Forum, the WHO themselves, who are getting great mileage, the UN, uh, EU vaccination bodies, they all see an opportunity to further their strategies. And I think they're remorselessly putting pressure on the governments. And the governments are also caught up in a fear self-reinforcing loop that as they've scared the hell out of the population, like they've scared the hell out of the people with propaganda yeah. and they published their plans for this, use social media, isolate people who, who call dissent, use the mass media. It's all published back in March. That was their strategy. They've scared the hell out of the public and the public now in turn is screaming at the government to shut the schools and shut this and shut yeah. that. So between the top-down pressure and the self-reinforcing insane loop of fear and, and psychosis in all the countries, you've got this massive mess. And yeah. anyone who stands up and tries to say, you know, guys, can you look at the science for a moment? Mm -hmm. They get knocked down. It's like they a steamroller. They just get knocked yeah. down. It's a crisis. Uh, but, but, but. Yeah, and th that's why we're having this conversation. I think that's why it's important because I want to bring, like we're trying to bring you the, the facts, just the facts. I think people have the right to decide to be scared or not. They have the right to decide if they're isolating at home or not, right? I think their livelihood depends on this. We know very well that stress is very critical. You know, stress can really damage someone's mental health and also physical health, of course. Mm -hmm. We know about that. Um, broken relationships and all of that, right? So a lot of things are being forced on us and people like you said they are scared very scared like here in canada for example even though masks outdoors is not mandated yet i hope it won't be but i don't know you see a lot of people walking around with masks or even alone inside the car like wearing masks and that to me that's very sad because they're doing that because they have no clue what the science says because what the science says is not on the media yet unfortunately so that to me is very scary. I think people have the right to know the facts, right? They, they can make their own minds. Yeah, I mean, if you want to be terrified, please do it on your own time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that exactly. makes sense. Uh, but no, people I, are scientifically illiterate now more than ever before, it seems to me. That's what this whole fiasco has shown. They're innumerate. They can't understand basic percentages or risks. Yeah. The people have become so dumbed down with the last 20 or 30 years of media fixation that it looks like they're just, they literally are just like a herd and they understand it seems nothing. Now, but you've got to also defend them and say they have been propagandized oh, yeah. with the most powerful propaganda machine this year, really since 30s, 1930s Germany and 40s. Yeah. I mean, the power of this propaganda machine, I have watched in horror since April. I cannot believe what they are saying on the media to people. Yeah. It makes no sense, but I know that 99% of people are just believing it. Well, the experts yeah. can't all be wrong. Well, the, right. no, they can't all be wrong and you're right. And you think, yeah, but I'm going by the data and the science. That's why I'm happy I'm right. They're ignoring the data and the science, or even worse, censoring it and twisting it. Yeah. So 
I am actually right. And I know I am. And that was in April. Guess what? Everything I said and all my people around the world on our network and those professors from who got in trouble, we were actually all right on every single aspect. We were 90% right on the framework of this thing. And the authorities all the way through were largely 90% wrong. And yet people still attack us for the 10% we didn't predict exactly. Yeah. But we were 90% yeah. right. And the authorities yeah. driving this were 90% wrong. I but know. people, they want to believe their authorities. The yeah. modern people, I think, in the old days, the people were a bit cynical and distrusting of governments and politicians and stuff. But the modern people seem to be just... Yeah, and that's uh, that's one thing I was talking about uh, still this week. In Brazil, it's very different from Canada. In, in Canada, trust in the government is way higher. People tend to follow the rules, trust the government. In Brazil, it's very difficult to mandate any, anything because people don't trust the government. There's a lot of corruption and stuff. So that, unfortunately, is a positive thing in, in the midst of all this chaos going on, right? It's, it's difficult. Well, yeah, I agree. And we need a hell of a lot more than that. Now, you don't want too much yeah. of it. You don't want anarchy, but you no, need a healthy not. amount of it. And we used to have a healthy amount. And I noticed in Brazil as well, several phone videos came out of Brazil where they broke into hospitals where people were being told there were loads of deaths. Now, this was back in March, April, before yeah. Brazil actually came to its curve. Yeah. Um, they broke into hospitals and went around the wards and they were empty. And like the Brazilian people were getting angry with pressure on lockdowns at that time. Now, in fairness, months later, they actually got their virus rise. So yeah. there is a genuine challenge now. But back yeah. then, they were all being told to lock down. And the point was, no one would acknowledge the seasonality. So they're locking down months before it's going to even start, like Peru and Chile. Right. All these countries now have the highest deaths per million in the world, not just by month, but by overall. And they locked down like back in March. And no one seems yeah. to get this. Lockdown doesn't help, sadly. Now, if the countries, back in February, we knew this in February, if you got the vitamin D status up in your aged and your population, and you got them to eat nutrient-dense food, and you took away junk food, and you got their insulin and glucose down, their leptin resistance down, you could have made an enormous positive impact on the tragedy that was coming. I, I interviewed guys from India on this back in early April. Mm -hmm. We knew this, and we said, but like these countries, when the season comes for influenza, they're going to get hit, and, and they could easily take action. But no one cared. No one was interested in anything but lockdowns yeah, or vaccines it, yeah. like that might exactly. come next year. Yeah, that it's was just it. fear mongering, fear mongering. And that's the focus of my channel here is really to teach people what to eat to naturally improve your immunity. And then that's what's going on. We can never kill a virus. You can never protect it, live in a glass bubble. We need to face the world as like we always done in the past, right? So it's naive yeah. from us to believe that we're gonna be sanitize our hands and not be exposed to viruses. The best defense is our defense, right? You always be in our defense. So we need to take care of that. But like you said very well, I don't know why people are not talking about it. I don't know, maybe it's uh, too soft of a conversation. It's better to find something uh, extreme, something that you know, incites fear in people, I don't know. And I think we need to talk a little bit about um, uh, two things. Uh, you mentioned that um, the Ferguson's um, models and everything, um, all of that, right? So they model, they, they preview, they, they predicted a certain amount of death in many countries. They predicted, uh, in, even in the US and Georgia state, they said, oh my God, if they do not lock down, they're gonna be like droves of people dying and stuff. So I, I know you have like, at least one slide when you show like the, the predictions and also you show the actual data because we now know, right? We now, we can do this now because we know the fact. So if you could share that, that would be uh, enlightening. Ferguson and Imperial College, and they are funded massively by pharma. So you could argue they were biased, but they based their infection fatality rate that we talked about earlier and based their modeling 
on guess what? On six flights out of Wuhan, China, around 680 people total and six infections on those flights. It's in their paper. That is the main basis of their model. Wow. And no one knows that. I mean, no one that's that. insane. And Professor Michael Levitt, Nobel Prize winner, who worked out from the Chinese data and verified with the Italian that this thing was self-controlling and self-limiting, independent of lockdowns and would follow the curve, he had to use other Nobel laureates to actually force uh, Ferguson to reply to him. And he wow. said, why aren't you using the Diamond Princess cruise ship? Here is the mathematics. Your model is out by a factor of 10 to 12. And Ferguson and Imperial College refused to engage. Wow. They were hell-bent on going with that model. So it's just very suspicious that they wouldn't even say, look, this is our model, but in fairness, it's maybe massively over-predicting because we've also got all this other data from real world Diamond Princess cruise ship and from real world, you know, Chinese data that says it could be 10 times lower. They didn't, they said nothing. So I'll share now the predictions and the models. Right, um, that's good. That's very good. I, okay, so on the left, here's kind of doing nothing. There's two sets of modeling here with Sweden having up to 80 or 90,000 dead. And then with moderate, if you will, restrictions, um, here's where they would be. Again, enormous deaths, 40, 50,000 yeah. deaths. And in the blue is what actually happened with no lockdown. Oh, right? Yeah. And I have video footage from CNN in early May yeah. the 6th. They were in Stockholm and they were shocked. They went and interviewed people elderly women getting their hair cut, people in cafes. They were told to stay an arm's length, but people were all having glass of wine in cafes. And CNN were going around with their cameras saying, oh my God, they're insane. No, this is what happened. So out by a factor of, actually the models were out by a factor of even up to 14. Well, yeah. You know? yeah. And on the right, you can see all the different uh, ones here and again you can see sweden in the green dashed line cumulative uh, sweden proved it sweden are the gold standard in epidemic management i like to say they are now actually would you believe they are now practically back to normal right. and they have no masks and they have very few basic measures and they opening up crowds i think to 500 so essentially, Sweden for months now are living effectively normally. Yeah. And people months. compare to, to the Nordic neighbors, right? My, my fiance is from Norway, and we know what happened in Norway. They never, well, when they locked down, it was very mild lockdown. It's very short as well. And they opened up restaurants. They never mandated masks. So people are going around. People are allowed to together. I think right now they are allowing up to 600 people outdoors, events and stuff. They are opening up and stuff, right? So they never, they always compared, oh, no, the lockdown. It was a very mild thing. It's comparable to Sweden in many aspects. So many people don't say that. And then, yeah. Yeah. And then the you Nordic have UK and you have Belgium, right? That's locked down and had huge uh, deaths, even larger than uh, Sweden. Yeah, I mean, there's no correlation between lockdown and mortality outcomes across Europe or anywhere or across states of America, no lockdown versus high lockdown. There is no connection. That's the fact. Sweden were destined to have a much higher mortality spike than the Nordics. And it was nothing to do with the measures right. they took. It was to do with their prior season. So, I mean, I can just briefly, I'll share again to yeah. hammer this home. Oh, here's Ireland. Let me just show you really briefly. Oh, yeah. So 95%, as I said, in Ireland were never, uh, of the people who died, were never given an intensive care. 
And you can see here's our actual epidemic curve. Here's the people who died in deaths per million. And if I take those 95% out, this is what the curve looks like. Mm, yeah. Obviously, there was no, there was less than one person per million died at the peak who was not in this ancient, you know, moribund group. Right. And then Ireland here, I showed this as well, and it's going to be similar for other countries. We had a soft 2019 mortality. This is the first five months of the year. That's where we had our epidemic. But for all the years, you can see 19 had a surprisingly low mortality. And then when you go to 20, that's including our epidemic. It's no different yeah. than any private previous years. And yeah. it's not even higher, even though you'd expect it to be up here because of this lack of dying here. It's not, mm -hmm. right? And if you look at the monthly, there, there's our bad month in April. Guess what? The bad month of April is no worse than January in 17 and 18. Right. If, if, I, if, if yeah. I mixed up the dates here, you couldn't even pick out yeah. 2020. Right. This, yeah. And people are shocked when they see this. Um, yeah. But I'll, oh, I have, by the way, another thing I think you were asking earlier. I have all yeah. the lockdown papers showing right. it doesn't help with mortality. And it's at this Great. link. Yeah. So I can send Great. that. Oh, here's Sweden. So people are going to like this because Sweden did no lockdown. And like I say, CNN had videos in May just after the peak of their epidemic and people are getting their hair cut and they have no yeah. masks and there are bars and everything open. So here's Sweden's death. And you can see it goes from around 650 per million people um, in the summer and then each of the peaks here is the winter where it goes up to 900 or 950 per million. So there's a big increase every winter in right. every country. But you'll see there this huge difference peaking in January or February or December, depending, uh, in the winter. But look at 19 for Sweden yeah, and look at the early average. part of 20. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have only half the increase. There are thousands of people that would normally die, you know, with flu and other diseases just didn't happen. So they built up this big stock of people, sadly, you know, and when Corona was going to hit, of course they're going to get a hit. And in fact, the hit they got was only compensating for the, for the lack of mortality here. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, this is the reality. And if you uh, just to, if you take 18 and project it out and say, well, what if 21 now is like 18, like a normal year in Sweden? Well, you can put it out here, just copy across. Sweden could, in the next winter coming, get a lot of mortality. And you're going to find SARS-CoV-2 on people because it's endemic now when you're PCR right. testing. And you could have a hysteria if you wanted. Yeah. But no one would realize the winter is no different than any prior winter where we did nothing. That's true. You know? That's right. Do you have that? Uh, yeah, this is very enlightening. I think I like to put things in perspective so people can compare to previous years. It's very important to see if this year is really something that out of the ordinary, like really something you need to be scared of. And this is pictures of Sweden during the pandemic, right? Or right now. This is uh, September. So for the last couple All of right. months, they're like this. And they're even in buses, no masks. No, they've given up the distancing, pretty much everything. During the mm -hmm. pandemic in May, in the CNN video, probably fewer people on the streets, yeah. but the rules were largely the same. No masks. Sweden have been very clear. The mask science is so weak. It is utterly inappropriate uh, to bring in masks because the science is too weak. It's unscientific. Yeah. So they've been very clear on this all the way. Yeah. Okay, so on lockdown, I'll just share something here now. And it's kind of the evidence table that we use in engineering. So I put this together in like late April. Already we had the data. So the evidence against lockdown being better than the normal pandemic guidelines that Sweden did with a bit of distancing mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, hands and maybe the elderly staying out of the way. Uh, the evidence is all overwhelmingly against lockdown having added anything. So we have Professor Carl Hennigan of Oxford University, the Woods Hole, uh, Ben Israel in Israel, uh, Professor of Mathematics published a paper back in early May, same thing, 
Lockdown did not correlate. And Professor Levitt showed the same thing as well and published data. And there was a detailed German statistical paper. And they said that the distancing and normal measures brought the R number down, but that lockdown, if anything, added a tiny percentage. And the right. Koch Institute in Germany clearly showed that the R number had come right down before the lockdown actually went into place. And we saw the same in nearly every country in Europe. So this is dawn. And I can share as well a graph from a couple of studies that shows there's no correlation between lockdown severity and mortality outcome. It's right. a scatter plot. There is no yeah. correlation anywhere, anywhere. So pre, pre, yeah, continue, please. Yeah, so there's no correlation anywhere. So there's a couple of different studies that have done the graphical format, and you can see it at one glance. And mm -hmm. there is a relationship with your mortality, as I mentioned earlier, and how soft or hard your prior uh, flu season was. That's a strong relationship. Mm -hmm. But lockdown, nada. No good. Nothing there. Oh, good. Sorry, guys. Yeah, and uh, okay, so the bottom line about lockdowns then we can uh, assume, well, we know the damage it causes, right? We don't need evidence for that, I suppose. So we know how damaging it is. And uh, there, is, there seems to be a lack of evidence showing any effectiveness when it comes to controlling the spread or flattening the line or anything like that. Um, when it comes to lockdowns. So, and, and we are repeating the same thing. And we have data, we have published studies, we have professionals, high caliber people talking about this. And the WHO now talk about this too. So it's very sad and surprising uh, to see countries like Canada, Ireland, uh, UK, Australia, doing the same thing. I mean, if they're not basing the decisions on, uh, on the science, what are they basing the decisions on? It just makes well, us wonder. Uh, as Professor Levitt said back in when I interviewed him in March, Nobel Prize winner, he said, this is basically medi medieval superstition. It's that bad. Science yeah. has yeah. been just ignored. And now here we are. That was back in April. Yeah. He was in February, March and April trying to tell the world this. And here we are now coming into in Europe anyway, October, coming into the winter where we're going to see respiratory rise and we're going to find SARS-CoV-2 on some of the aged people who die. Yeah. yeah. But it's going to be a normal winter. Nothing like the actual epidemic. But they're all obsessed with locking down to try and stop the winter. It, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. insane. I, there's no other word for it. It's insane. I, yeah, in the conversation, yeah, I agree completely with you. And the conversation here is like, we did it once, we can do it again. I was like, what do you mean? There's no evidence for that. We did it once, meaning we bankrupt everyone and they brought like mental illness to people and everything. Well, but the conversation has been, of course, there's always something looming in the horizon, right? The second wave. So they have been talking about the freaking second wave during the summer. So people, let's keep the fear like in people's minds. The second wave is coming, it's gonna be even more devastating. And they re, uh, ramped up the testing as we talked. So way more tests. And of course, they're getting a case damage. So the media is focusing on the positive tests, not the hospitals. And now we have the, the start of a second wave in which, like, I mean, like you, you just showed very well, uh, is a season thing, right? So of course, cases will increase. Uh, hospitals will be fuller than the summer. We will find COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 right? You're going to find influenza and everything. So it will happen. But then it's a choice for people to really be hysterical about it or put in perspective compared to the previous years. And as it's looking right now, I think with Spain data, France data, uh, it seems like it, you're probably more of a average winter, would you say? I would say, yeah, Rodrigo, I'd say uh, it probably will be average uh, because many countries that were hit already the same thing will apply as applied to sweden for their right. epidemic now we have a prior pretty nasty year mm -hmm. for most countries so they those countries are going to see not so much 
in the coming winter. But the authorities will claim that all their masks and lockdowns and medieval nonsense, yeah. they'll claim that the reason the winter coming is not actually that bad is because of their medieval, yeah. you know, superstition. So we're yeah. kind of we're kind of caught really. I think one reason that they're forcing in all these lockdowns and things over the summer that make no sense based on the cases is they want to have an excuse for why the coming winter is not actually that bad. They want to bank right. an excuse in yeah. advance. Yeah. And if you do something different right now, people might wonder um, why they did the lockdowns in the first place. Like, why did you bring yeah, so it, much misery? We cannot do it differently right now, right? I, I call it the tiger horn deceit. Right. I did a video on this. And basically, you know, the village is attacked by tigers and they kill a lot of people. And the chief comes up as the tigers begin to go away. He comes up with this horn, a magic horn, and they blow it every night and everyone has to blow it. That's lockdowns. But the tigers are already moving on anyway. So it looks like the horn did something. So that's what we saw with the lockdowns in Europe. If you look at the mathematics, the lockdown came in after it had already turned, right. but they still claimed it did something. But then what you can do is, if people say, hold on, did the lockdown do anything? You can just tell them to shut up and censor them. And you can start blowing the horn louder and say the reason the tigers have not come back is because of the horn. Yeah, but if you exactly. stop using the horn and the tiger stay away, then someone might start questioning you. Yeah, and that's not good. Not a good thing. Yeah, uh, oh. I think they're worried about saving face a lot uh, when it comes to all of this, and that's why we bring this information. I hope people appreciate this kind of information. Again, I, we just want to empower them. But if they want to be scared, I'm fine with it. If they want to wear masks, I'm definitely fine yeah. with it. I mean. I'm pro freedom saying, I think people can choose what they, they do, how scared they are. And more like the Swedish kind of uh, way of dealing with this, like trusting the population a bit more, enforcing a bit less, mandating a bit less. So I think that it has been working well for them. And it looks like the second wave in Sweden is looking pretty okay. Like nothing to be scared about yet. Of course, it's difficult to predict, like it's nature, right? But it is looking, it seems to be looking good. How would you, uh, deal if you were like a, the president of X um, country, how would you, would you deal with a second wave of now one? How would you deal with it? Right. Well, what I would have done since the epidemic was over, uh, as I stated back in April, uh, as soon as it fell and the hospitals were clearly emptying out in April in Ireland, late April coming into May, I would have removed all measures. Yeah. And I would have said to the people, the reason I'm removing all measures is because of the science. I'll explain it briefly. And if we see uh, a problem beginning to rise, uh, I, I will put back in measures. But I want to see evidence before I do it, because the science suggests that in the summer, almost nothing will be going on. And next September, October, we may end up putting measures back in again if the hospitals become problematic. And what would have happened in Ireland in that case is we would have had a whole summer of sports and mixing and nothing different would have happened. And the only problem would be come September, October, if a problem rose again, you'd have to get the people back on board they'd be happy now having lived with their good economy and all of their living and all the cancers taken care of and all the good stuff all summer. Uh, but they might not want to go back to locking down. But I think actually they would because you'd say to them, we did our lockdown back when we needed it. Now we need to do it again, guys. Come on, we let you all summer. Now we need to do it again. And I think people would say, oh, okay then, winter's coming, the virus might rise look after granny, let's do it. But they didn't do that. They kept us locked down on and off and wearing mandatory masks all summer long. So that's all credibility gone. The authorities for me have zero credibility and I'm gonna put that in the record because when they brought in all kinds of restrictions in the summer, which made no scientific sense, they refused to look at all the studies that showed their lockdowns didn't do anything even in the epidemic. Yeah. 
And then they brought in mandatory masks with prison sentences and fines in the middle of the summer when the hospitals were empty. Right. Zero credibility. You're gone, yeah. guys. Yeah, that, that's and really I'm, bad. I'm correct. Yeah. It's yeah, shocking. it's just facts. It's just facts. And I really hope people start uh, questioning um, uh, their own beliefs on this, just seeing all this data, just practicing a little bit of uh, maybe critical thinking as well. Just like, would it, I mean, is it really so? I mean, isn't there other people talking about some, uh, another perspective? I mean, am I not tired of hearing the same thing over and over and over? Is it worth it that my business is going downhill because of something I don't understand. Maybe I want to understand a bit more. So hopefully they listen to this. Maybe they, they see this and, and go search for more information, even though we're fighting a censorship wave, a very hard one that I've never seen in my life. So it's a bit difficult, but I think that it's difficult to hold back the truth, right? I think I really believe that the truth has power and we cannot hold it back forever. So that's why I appreciate our conversation here. I think fear is really a way of controlling people. If peer, people are afraid, it's easier to, um, yeah, at least nudge them in certain directions, right? And facts, I believe they're freeing so people can make uh, wiser choices based on actual data. And that's why we're here talking about it. Um, I really appreciate so much your time and your um, all your information. Uh, and I really wish you keep on this amazing, amazing work. We need people like you to collect the data and just show and share hard truths or hard facts, statistics, graphs, all this nice stuff. And where can people learn more about you and your videos and um, everything you have? Right, Rodrigo. No, great to be here. And uh, I'll send you on all the slide packs. I, if people Google Ivor Cummins, I-V-O-R-C-U-M-M-I-N-S, uh, you'll see my YouTube on the first page and the fatemperor.com website. A lot of my stuff is on YouTube, all videos with all the slides and data like we talked about. So YouTube's pretty good. And Twitter as well. I've around 100K followers. And uh, I share a lot of data on Twitter too. And I argue a lot with other scientists. <laughs> yeah, that's very good. And again, I, I, I know you since, uh, well, for, for many years now um, with the low carb community and all of that back in the days. And I know you, you did some very science-based work on cholesterol, right? You're putting forth some uh, science about cholesterol and all of that. So very good, very good. I hope you go back to that in the future and just talking also about health and science. And I really hope we can go back to normal. I don't care about this new normal we should not accept something being imposed down our throats and when we have all the science to you know to to show us otherwise so i really hope the population start to wake up a little bit be a be more critical and and yeah just maybe say no for for a while just no before you show me the evidence i think that's good practice not say no as an anarchist no one wants anarchy here we just want thinking people you can say okay so asking me to do this, so can you please show me the evidence so I can, you know, be on board. And when people understand, they'll probably be on board too, right? It's, it's better, they buy the idea, they are on board. So, but they're, I think they're being sheltered from, from a lot of this data. And that's why I appreciate your work a lot. And congratulations on that. And thank you very much again for uh, all this time uh, for our chat today here. Thank you very much, Harper. Thanks, Rodrigo. Till next time. <laughs> Bye-bye.